On May 29th, 1950, the Roanoke shops of the Norfolk and Western Railway finished construction on the latest member of their J-Class 484 Northern locomotives. She would be numbered 611, and unbeknownst to the builders at the time, she would eventually rise and be known as the Spirit of Roanoke and the Queen of Steam, destined to be the last of her kind. Just after the beginning of World War II, Norfolk and Western's mechanical engineering team was looking into how to get more power out of their steam locomotives. They were trying to deal with rising mainline passenger traffic over the Blue Ridge Mountains, which tended to have extremely steep grades in both Virginia and West Virginia. They felt that the new northern type locomotives might be better suited for this, and at first they would build 11 of what they would call the Class J's numbered 600 to 610, at their Roanoke East End shops between 1941 and 1943. They were streamlined, painted black with a Tuscan red stripe, wrapped with golden yellow linings and letterings. They were constructed with streamlining in mind, so maintenance on them wasn't as difficult as with other streamlining that was often placed over top of existing locomotives and they were all equipped with a Norfolk and Western style Hancock Long Bell 3 chime whistle. These locomotives were the most powerful 484 passenger steam locomotives ever built, with 70 inch driving wheels, 80,000 pounds of force in tractive effort, and an operating boiler pressure of 300 PSI. They were all given Timken roller bearings on their drivers, as well as their tender axles, which gave them smooth running as well as much better acceleration. The Jays were swiftly put to work and operated about 500 miles per day. They quickly proved themselves to be exceedingly reliable and ran evenly on the mountainous and relatively short route at an average speed of 40 miles per hour. On flat terrain, they could hit 110. However, after World War II, passenger traffic on the Norfolk and Western started to decrease Due to the rising use of cars, people just weren't taking the train nearly as often, and as a result, they would only build three more of the Class J's, numbers 611 through 613, in 1950. These three were actually the last passenger steam locomotives built by Norfolk and Western, as well as the last mainline passenger steam locomotives built in the U.S. in general. 611 was placed into service on May 29th, 1950, finished at a cost of about $251,544. She joined the rest of her sisters and began hauling Norfolk and Western's premier passenger trains, such as the Powhatan Arrow, the Pocahontas, and the Cavalier, running 676 miles between Norfolk, Virginia, and Cincinnati, Ohio. She even helped move some of Southern Railway's trains on occasion, like their Birmingham Special, the Pelican, and the Tennessean. She didn't just handle the fancy express trains either. She would be used to haul mail trains, as well as much more local passenger trains. And on June 29th, she went to Schaefer's Crossing Engine Terminal in Roanoke for her first monthly maintenance and an inspection of her right size cylinder head. Then, on September 24th, 1952, 611, as well as her sister, 613, hauled the Eisenhower Special Presidential Campaign Train from Columbus, Ohio to Canova, West Virginia. Aboard was, as the name may imply, Dwight D. Eisenhower, who was a war hero, former U.S. General of the Army, who had served in World War II, and would eventually win the election to become the next President of the United States of America seven weeks after the train. By 1955, 611 had run a total of 30,628 miles, and she was sent back to Roanoke Shocks for scheduled repair work. But only a few months after that was finished, on January 23rd, 1956, she derailed near Cedar, West Virginia, while pulling the Pocahontas, which was running a bit late. Her engineer was killed, and 60 passengers and crew were injured. Once she was put back on the rails, it was revealed that most of her damage was superficial, so she was given extensive repairs and returned to service just the next month. And while it was the late 50s, Norfolk and Western had clung to their steam locomotives a lot longer than most companies, 
partially due to their extensive coal traffic, and the fact that their president, Robert H. Smith, just really liked steam locomotives, but he would retire on March 31st, and he was replaced with Stuart T. Saunders. Saunders was much more interested in dieselizing, and had absolutely no interest in continuing steam locomotive operations. He immediately ordered 268 GP9s from EMD, and as such, 611s as well as her sister's days were numbered. They were reassigned to freight duties, which the Jays could actually handle quite easily, though by the fall of 1958, the first of them was sent for scrapping. 604. Some of them, like 611, were lucky enough to hold on until their five-year boiler flu time certificate expired in 1959. In the end, the sisters combined ran more than 3 million miles, 4,800,000 kilometers, in revenue service. In January of 1959, 611 was taken out of revenue service and placed into storage alongside some of her sisters, 603, 606, 608, and 609 in Bluefield, West Virginia. They were all waiting to be sent for scrap. But at this time, a man stepped in, Washington, D.C. lawyer W. Graham Clater Jr., He's notable as he would eventually become an officer for the Southern Railway in 1963, as well as serving as their president from 1967 to 1977, but at that time, he was just a lawyer. With a passion for railroads, he tried to convince Saunders that number 611 should be retained in working order, as he noted that she was in very good condition with an extended boiler flu time certificate thanks to the repair work that had been done following her 1956 accident. Clater Jr. was vice chairman of the Roanoke chapter of the National Railway Historical Society, and he requested that 611 be moved under her own power back to Roanoke, where she had been born for preservation and possible continued excursion service. Saunders, for all his flaws, wasn't, say, Perlman and he was receptive to the idea of at least saving one of the Jays. So, on May 22nd, he agreed, and 611 was separated from her sisters and put into storage at the Schaefer's Crossing Roundhouse, though sadly, she would never see her sisters again. As I said when this video started, 611 was the only Jay that was saved. 611 hung around for a few months, and then on August 30th, 1959, the Appalachian Power Company Vice President, W. Graham Clater Sr., yes, Clater Jr.'s father, wound up getting permission to borrow 611 to haul a special train from Roanoke to Norfolk. This train consisted of APCO employees as well as their families and let them travel over to Virginia Beach, Virginia, before returning to Roanoke on September 2nd. It was a nice treat for his employees, and 611, of course, pulled the train flawlessly. On October 18th, she traveled to Petersburg, Virginia, where she would pull a Washington, D.C. Chapter NRHS round-trip excursion from Washington Union Station to Norfolk. Six days after that, she wound up pulling the Norfolk and Western's farewell to steam excursion from Roanoke to Williamson and back again. When she returned to Roanoke, she was put back into the Schaefer's Crossing Roundhouse, officially being retired from revenue service on October 27th, and being stored alongside an M-Class 480, number 475. Since this 11 was now officially retired, there was still the chance that Saunders could choose to scrap her at this point. He'd only kept her around for a few extra excursion trips. But on November 3rd, he announced that, instead of doing this, since she still had some serviceable flues in her boiler, she wouldn't be scrapped. She would be used as a standby stationary boiler at the Roanoke shops. It wasn't until May of 1960 that Norfolk and Western completely shut down any and all steam operations for revenue service. They were one of the last major class ones to do so. But 611 still hung around for stationary purposes, and in 1961, a photographer, O. Winston Link, actually offered to buy her for $5,000, but Norfolk and Western said no, saying she wasn't for sale. A year after that, her boiler flu time certificate finally did actually expire, and she was returned to storage back at Schaefer's Crossing. 
Again, it seemed like there might be a risk of her possibly being sent for scrap, but Saunders seemed dedicated to keeping her alive. In late May of that year, he suddenly just decided to randomly donate her to the Roanoke City Council, and Claytor would personally donate $500 for her continued upkeep. In spring of 1963, she was cosmetically restored and put on static display at the new Roanoke Transportation Museum in Wessena Park, which had opened on Memorial Day that year. In late 1966, at Claytor's request again, the SOU president, D.W. Brosman, launched that railroad steam excursion program using MS Class 282 number 4501. Those trips included an NW trackage. By the 1970s, the notion of preserving steam locomotives was now fairly common knowledge, and heritage railways were all over America. Plus, certain steam locomotives had been held for excursion service. As it turned out, people just genuinely liked them. As such, since 611 was one of a kind and in relatively good shape, the notion of returning her to operation was considered. The Roanoke chapter of the NRHS supported the idea and wound up seeking permission from then Norfolk and Western president, John Fishwick, to perform a hydrostatic test on her. Fishwick said they could test all they wanted, but he absolutely refused to let 611 run on Norfolk and Western trackage again. It wasn't until 1981, two weeks after Fishwick retired, September 30th, that his successor, Robert B. Clater, who was the brother of Graham, you see, the Claytor family is really involved in this. 611 owes much of her existence to the Claytors, just so we're clear. Well, he was much in line with his family's steam preservation policies. The, the Claytors are really the anti-Perlmans, is where we're going with this. Mr. Perlman, I can't help but notice that you have destroyed all these beautiful steam locomotives. I cannot abide by this. I must stop you. For the good of all, at long last, a worthy opponent coming to defend those dastardly steam engines from me. Our battle will be legendary! Anyway, Robert B. Clater wound up leasing 611 from the Roanoke City Council for $5,000 a year. And on October 16th, she was removed from her display and sent back to her birthplace in the Roanoke shops to be inspected and prepared for her trip to her restoration site. They were surprised to find that her bearings were already greased up, and it was found out that this was due to some Norfolk and Western crew workers who had secretly entered the museum on the off days in January of 1981 for this specific purpose. Criminal trespassing? Yes. Totally worth it? Yeah. On October 22nd, she left Roanoke, and three days later, she arrived at the SOU's Norris Yard Steam Shop in Irondale, Alabama. The restoration work was performed by SOU master mechanic Bill Purdy and his team, and it started with the supervision from a former Roanoke Shop's foreman, Paul Hausman, as well as ex-Norfolk and Western draftsman Mark W. Faville who had brought some of the original J-Class design drawings. And while 611 was in fairly good shape, all things considered, it was found that her injectors, dynamo, as well as some other mechanical appliances had to be completely rebuilt, and they were. Her firebox sheets and her flues were replaced, and it was found that her feed water pump was actually cracked. So that was also replaced with a new one that was actually taken from Norfolk and Western Class A, number 1218. Naturally, they couldn't borrow all the parts from other locomotives, so some new ones had to be fabricated, like the crosshead guide shoes and the boiler stay bolts. Two of her left side rod bearings were refurbished by Timken, and her original Westinghouse 8ET brake system was replaced with a brand new 26RL brake stand that would be a lot easier on maintenance, as well as getting replacement parts for it. They also considered style points here, and they sheathed her cab with varnished hardwood, and installed a radio speaker system to enable the crew to communicate with the train dispatcher, which on the modern railway was very important. They also swapped out her original single beam headlight 
for a vertical dual beam headlight instead. And a lot of her new parts were also acquisitioned from the remains of her sisters that had long since been scrapped. Some of the components put into her running gear were from 605. So the deaths of her siblings actually helped her to live on in this case. Their spirits go with her if you want to be dramatic about it. The restoration work wound up costing around $600,000, and it would be Purdy's last contribution before he retired. For the first time in 23 years, on July 5th, 1982, 611 was steamed up. She wound up taking over excursion service from Southern number 2716, who unfortunately had to be retired due to some firebox issues she was having. And during that time, Norfolk and Western and the Southern would merge to form Norfolk Southern Railway, or just NS. And during the merger, they retained the steam excursion program, and it would double the available trackage for 611 to run on. Robert Clater became the first chairman and CEO of Norfolk Southern, and he would serve until 1986, after she completed test runs from Irondale to Chattanooga, Tennessee, on August the 15th and the 16th, 611 departed for Roanoke with Clater as the engineer, as well as his son Preston as the fireman. Okay, look, I'm not even upset here, because if I was running a railroad and I was able to bring a steam locomotive back into the operation, do you honestly believe I wouldn't serve as the engineer at least one time? I mean, come on. Man's living the dream here, I'm just saying. She arrived back in Roanoke on August 22nd, just in time for the city's centennial anniversary, where Clater would make a public speech, in which he called 611 Roanoke born, Roanoke bred, and Roanoke proud. This speech was very well received, and 611 became an icon of Roanoke's railroading history. On Labor Day weekend of 1982, she pulled her inaugural excursion run, pulling the NRHS Roanoke Chapter's Centennial Limited train from Roanoke to Norfolk. She was supposed to be turned on the Lambert's Point Yard turntable for her return trip, but she derailed on the sharply curved approach track. This line would actually be modified years later for this exact reason, and somewhat embarrassingly, some General Electric C30-7s were actually called in to haul the return trip, while 611 was re-railed and towed back to Roanoke for some repairs. Her second trip went a lot better. On September 6, she made a one-way excursion trip from Roanoke to Alexandria, Virginia, with Graham Clater running her this time. On October 19th, she went to Bluefield and Lager, West Virginia, where she was tested to be turned on the Weiss in preparation for some round-trip excursions from Roanoke to Bluefield and Lager that were to happen on October 23rd, 24th, and 30th. They wanted to make sure she could actually turn around here, because they didn't want a repeat of her first outing. But she could do it, so it was fine. On Thanksgiving weekend, she hauled her last 1982 excursion, which was actually called the Oyster Bowl Special, and ran from Roanoke to Norfolk and back again. During that time, ex W locomotive foreman Frank Collins served as her primary engineer. In 1983, she pulled more public and private excursion trips for the Norfolk Southern Steam Program, including one where she double-headed with Savannah and Atlanta 750. After that, she wound up hauling the longest one-way excursion trip from Richmond to the Midwest. And once she was out there, she ran some trips out of Chicago, Illinois, and St. Louis, Missouri, on Chicago and Northwestern trackage, as well as some ex-nickel plate and Wabash rails that Norfolk and Western had acquired when it merged with those railroads. After the 1983 season, she went back to Irondale to have her firebox repaired and stay bolts replaced, before resuming service in April of 1984. On May 19th, 1984, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, or ASME, named 611 a National Historic Mechanical Engineering Landmark, and presented a plaque to the Roanoke Transportation Museum. On August 11th and 12th, she pulled some more excursions between Erie, Pennsylvania and Buffalo, New York, for the Lakeshore Railway Historical Society. On August 19th and the 20th, 
She double-headed with Nickel Plate Road 765. Yes, indeed, they have met, taking a train from Erie to Ludlow, Kentucky. On November 10th and 11th, 611 visited Jacksonville, Florida to haul the Sawany Steen Special Round Trip Excursion for the North Florida Chapter, NRHS. On June 1985, she ran the longest one-way NRHS Independence Limited excursion trip from Roanoke to Kansas City, Missouri. She received an overhaul in early 1986 that included repairs to her running gear as well as receiving a new ash pan. During the Roanoke NRHS convention in August of 1987, she pulled another round trip from Roanoke to Radford, Virginia, where she ran side by side with the recently restored number 1218, which was actually just pulling an empty train of hoppers at the time, but they would later double head at Radford. After 1987, Collins would wind up retiring and his assistant, Bob Saxton, would then serve as 611's primary engineer until late 1994. Another period of maintenance took place to replace her flues, and she returned to service in September of 1988. In June 1989, she joined another nickel plate locomotive, 587, to haul the Roanoke NRHS Chapter Independence Limited excursion trip from Cleveland, Ohio, back to Roanoke. On September 16th, she ran two round-trip excursions from Roanoke to Radford and Lynchburg, Virginia, pulling a matching set of 10 Tuscan Red passenger cars, commemorating the 40th anniversary of the Powhatan Aero re-equipment. Then in early 1991, Norris Yard maintainers replaced her crown sheet as well as overhauled her trailing truck. When she returned to service, she joined 1218 and 4501 on a triple header, which is scarcely seen in the modern day, hauling a 28-car passenger train from Chattanooga to Utawal, Tennessee. Pardon me, boys. Is this the Chattanooga choo-choo? 4501 would later break away and take a few coaches to Cleveland, Tennessee, and then back to Chattanooga while 611 and 1218 continued onwards to Atlanta, Georgia. After this trip, it was decided to give 611's tender a bit of a modification, a longer coal board bunker, which would let her run more than 300 miles without actually having to stop for coal, since, well, in the 90s, there just weren't that many places to stop for coal anymore. In late October 1992, 611 ran two round-trip excursions from Charlotte to Asheville, North Carolina. The first, on October 24th, wound up running via the Old Fort Loops. The second happened the next day, and it brought 20 passenger cars over the Saluda grade, which was the steepest standard gauge mainline railway grade in the United States at the time, although now that line is no longer in service. Taking the advice of the Norfolk Southern Piedmont Division Superintendent, Eugene Green, the Consus was oddly split up at the bottom of the grade to prevent the couplers on the passenger cars from braking while climbing the steepest part of it. 611 was assisted by three SD40-2s, who pulled the first 15 cars, while 611 pulled just the last five. 611 actually briefly had some wheel slipping issues and did stall for a few minutes, but she did eventually reach the top of the grade. The train was reassembled for the rest of the trip to Asheville, as well as the return trip back to Charlotte. In July of 1993, she pulled the NRHS Roanoke Chapter's 19th Annual Independence Limited Excursion, which arrived from Knoxville, Tennessee, via the Southern Railway's number 4501 at Richlands, Virginia. They were bound for Fort Wayne, Indiana. Sometime right after 1993, 611 was added to the National Park Service's Historic American Engineering Record, and in June 1994, she joined another double header with Frisco 1522 for the annual NRHS convention in Atlanta, with trips to Macon, Georgia, and Chattanooga, Tennessee. Then, on September 28, 1994, a consist was being moved at the Kenny Yard in Lynchburg for a planned NRHS excursion to Richmond which was to have been led by 611 in early October. The consists derailed, which damaged nine of the passenger cars, 
two of them were deemed unrepairable. The incident led Norfolk Southern to raise their liability insurance from $10 million to $25 million. And on October 29th, Norfolk Southern CEO David R. Good announced the decision to end the STEAM program due to rising insurance, maintenance costs, low spare system capacity, as well as delayed freight traffic. On December 3rd, 1994, 611 hauled the very last Norfolk Southern steam-powered excursion trip from Birmingham, Alabama to Chattanooga and back again. On December 5th, she headed back to her home in Roanoke. With a few brief stops in Atlanta, she arrived in her birthplace on December 7th. And after 12 years of excursion service with Norfolk Southern, her fire was damped out for one final time. Her boiler flu time certificate would expire in early 1995. Six Eleven sat in storage at the Roanoke shops until October 1995, when she was returned to the Roanoke City Council. She was put back on static display at the Transportation Museum, which by this point had been renamed from the Roanoke Transportation Museum to the Virginia Museum of Transportation Museum, or VMT. 611's new home was in the former Norfolk and Western Roanoke Freight Station, and appropriately, she sat under the Robert B. Clater and W. Graham Clater Jr. Pavilion. The brothers had passed away in 1993 and 1994, respectively. 611 was well taken care of at the museum, and in June of 2003, she was reunited with her old friend, number 1218, who was partially reassembled and cosmetically restored from her own cancelled overhaul that was supposed to happen between 1992 and 1996. In 2007, the pair were put on temporary display at the Roanoke shops to commemorate its 125th anniversary, and at that time, her original whistle, which is actually owned by Preston Clater, was on loan to the Steam Railroading Institute in Owasso, Michigan, where it was used by Pair Marquette. Merry Christmas! Yeah, really, go figure. In 2011, Roanoke City Council officially nicknamed 611 the Spirit of Roanoke, which the museum inscribed under her cab windows. And on October 2nd, 2012, the council donated number 611 and 1218 officially to the museum. Just the year before her official donation, however, in 2011, the Norfolk Southern CEO, Wick Mormon, decided that they were going to bring back the STEAM program under the name 21st Century STEAM, and this ignited intense speculation among the rail fanning community. Were they going to bring back 611? Were they going to bring back the Queen? The Queen would return? Because indeed, Many fans referred to her as the Queen of Steam on top of the spirit of Roanoke. She was a fan favorite, who'd already had a successful excursion career, and she was one of a kind and a very distinctive, easily recognizable locomotive. The museum heard these whispers of speculation, and on February 22nd, 2013, Bev Fitzpatrick, as well as other officials of the museum, formed the Fire Up 611 Committee to study the feasibility of returning her to service. Members of the committee actually included some who had worked with 611 since the 80s and 90s, including Preston Clater, volunteer firewoman Sherry George, and Steam Operations Corporation President Scott Lindsay. Both the museum and Norfolk Southern tested 611's bearings and confirmed that she was, well, in excellent condition. On June 28th, the museum launched the Fire Up 611 Capital Campaign, otherwise known as a fundraiser. They, they needed money to fix her that was gonna be really expensive, like really expensive. So it was imperative that they get as much money as possible. They aimed to raise three and a half million dollars by the end of October to require a maintenance facility for the restoration, but they were a million short. They only got two and a half million, still a very good amount of money, but not quite what they were hoping for. However, Norfolk Southern stepped in. They would wind up donating one and a half million of their own money after they received a bunch of proceeds from the auction of a Mark Rothko painting. 
Yes, really. I don't even know how they got that, but yeah. Either way, though, it put them well over their goal. And in April of 2014, several key appointments were made by the committee to the locomotive's mechanical team, and they made a formal agreement with the North Carolina Transportation Museum to use their ex-Southern Bob Julian Roundhouse to restore 611. The mechanical team included three people that had previously worked with her, the ex-Southern General Foreman of Steam, Douglas S. Carhan, the ex-Norfolk Southern Steam Department Foreman, Robert Uill, and Norfolk Southern Senior General Foreman, Bob Saxton. On May 24, 611 said goodbye to her friend 1218 and was towed out of the museum and moved down to the Roundhouse the following day. At the Streamliners at Spencer event the following weekend, the first bolt from 611 was removed and restoration work began on June 2nd. It was performed by Steam Operations Corporation with the help of 75 volunteers, including several from the Age of Steam Roundhouse in Sugar Creek, Ohio. By July 1st, she'd been completely stripped, and the work would include installing new flues, as well as a rear flue sheet, work on her boiler, repairs to her trucks, tender, cross-compound air pumps, safety valves, running gear, as well as the air brakes. All over the place she needed work done, but they got it done. She was able to meet the FRA safety guidelines and certification requirements. And on July 25th, while work was still ongoing, the committee and the North Carolina Museum offered behind-the-scenes tours of her restoration progress. Because, I mean, why not at that point? On February 23rd, 2015, 611's boiler passed a hydrostatic test, and she was test-fired on March 31st. Passing that, she was reassembled and repainted with paint donated from Exalta Coating Systems. Yes, really, that was nice of them. On May 9th, she moved under her own power for the first time in 21 years. And on the 21st, she completed a round-trip West Main Line test run from Spencer to Greensboro, North Carolina. On May 23rd, during the send-off celebration event, 10 guests each paid $611 to drive number 611. I get it! Shut it, Nappa. And on May 30th, she began her trip back home to Roanoke with Norfolk Southern CEO Mormon at the throttle. The next day, 611 was reunited with 1218, as well as Class Y6A, number 2156, who was on loan from the National Museum of Transportation in St. Louis until 2020. On June 6th and 7th, 2015, 611 hauled her first 21st century steam excursion in Virginia, running the American from Manassas to Front Royal on ex-Southern trackage. She would later haul the Cavalier excursion from Lynchburg to Petersburg on June 13th and 14th. On the 15th, she hauled a short freight train bound for Spencer, where she had to have her monthly boiler inspection at the North Carolina Transportation Museum. On July 1st, she returned to Roanoke again, where she ran two round-trip excursions, the Powhatan Arrow to Lynchburg in the morning and the Pelican to Radford in the afternoon during the Independence Day weekend celebrations. After this, though, Norfolk Southern actually ended the 21st Century STEAM program. However, unlike the last time they ended their program, this didn't spell the end for 611's new lease on life. She was continued to be allowed to haul some excursion trips over Norfolk Southern trackage, and other smaller railroads would eventually be a lot more welcoming to her presence, eager to have steam locomotive royalty around. I mean, who wouldn't want 611 there? I mean, come on! In February 2016, she received new front leading wheels and axles made by Brenco Product Engineering. After that, she ran two round-trip excursions with the NCTM, the Virginian from Spencer to Lynchburg on April 9th, and a sold-out train, the Blue Ridge Special, from Spencer to Asheville the following day. On April 23rd and 24th, she ran the Roanoker, which is such a weird name for anything, actually, I don't like it, round-trip excursion from Greensboro to Roanoke via Alta Vista, Virginia, on the former Virginian Railway main line. From mid-May to early June, she re-ran the previous year's Powhatan Arrow, Pelican, and American round-trip excursions, 
and after that went back to the NCTM for the summer events of cab rides, caboose rides, and cab experiences, whistleblowing, the works. She was a part of it all. However, on August 8th, she would be returned to Roanoke, under her own power, to be put on display back at the VMT. She was not going to stay that way, though, however. On Labor Day weekend, she was steamed up for the VMT's own events of cab tours and photo sessions, along with Norfolk and Western GP9 number 521. On September 7th, 611 returned to the North Carolina Transport Museum again for more events of cab rides. She's just going back and forth, just zigzagging all around. And yes, indeed, she would be sent back to Roanoke on October 24th. On January 6th, 2017, she went back again to the North Carolina Transport Museum for her annual FRA inspection. On April 8th, she ran the Virginian Round Trip Excursion and the next day's Charlotte Special Round Trip Excursion from Spencer to Charlotte in the morning and a second round trip excursion, the Piedmont Limited, that was from Spencer to Greensboro in the afternoon. Afterwards, 611 took part in the museum's 100 Years of American Steam event. After that event, she reran two round trip excursions, the Roanoke again, and the Cavalier. On May 23rd, the Virginia General Assembly officially named 611 as the official steam locomotive of Virginia. And additionally, it was found that her excursion economic impact was $4 million a year. That's how much she was bringing in, which is massive for a steam locomotive in the modern day. On Memorial Day weekend in 2017, she ran her final main line round trip excursions out of Roanoke, the Powhatan Arrow to Lynchburg and the Pocahontas to Radford. Those were the last contributions of the VMT executive director, Bev Fitzpatrick, before he retired at the end of 2017. But in 2018, 611 had a bit of a problem. She found herself unable to perform any mainline excursions due to new restrictions on private charters, which had been imposed by the Amtrak CEO, Richard Anderson. Richard. Richard? What are you doing, man? VMT still sent 611 out to have her annual FRA routine maintenance, and she did take part in smaller events around the museum. On September 26, she returned to the VMT under her own power, and after that, she was forbidden to run on the main line because she lacked a positive train control system, or PTC, which is a safety system in modern trains that, admittedly, yeah, it is pretty important, so I can kind of understand their issue here. The VMT then sought donations to equip 611 with positive train control, so she'd be allowed back on the main line again. In 2019, she was actually sent back out to Stroudsburg Railroad in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, for the five weekend Norfolk and Western reunion of steam events from September 27th to October 27th. Since she was still lacking both the PTC and cab signaling systems, 611 was paired behind a diesel for the trip to Stroudsburg. Eventually, she would find her way back to the North Carolina Transport Museum for more in-cab experiences. In early 2020, she was restricted to static display at the museum, but this was due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Obviously, there weren't a lot of guests when that was going on, but she was steamed up during the autumn season for some in-cab experiences. From late May to early October 2021, she returned to Strasbourg for weekends of excursions, and afterwards, she was sent into Strasbourg's workshops for her annual FRA inspection, and maintenance to her boiler stables. In 2022, she participated in more of Strasbourg's events, and on January 31st, 2023, she was placed on temporary outdoor display at the Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania, which is literally right across the street from Strasbourg. On May 21st to the 29th, she participated in her own farewell tour, and then she left on May 31st, returning back to the VMT for static display on June 2nd. But she's not staying there. Not at all, in fact. From this month to next month, she's slated to haul the Virginia Scenic Railway's weekend Shenandoah Valley Limited excursions between Goshen and Staunton, Virginia, running on the Buckingham Branch Railroad through the George Washington and Jefferson National Forests. That would mark her first fall season excursions through Virginia since 1994. 
and on August 22nd, the Shenandoah Valley Limited Excursion tickets went on sale. 611 left the VMT on September 14th and arrived at the VSR's Victoria Station in Goshen that afternoon. She did some test runs on September 28th and 29th in final preparations for excursions, and on September 30th, the VMT and VSR offered again some in cab experiences. The point is that 611 is being well taken care of, and despite constantly running into hurdles and restrictions placed on where she's allowed to operate, and despite short lines not necessarily being the best place for a large northern type to run, she's still keeping busy. The museum is dedicated to finding places to run her, to finding places that will appreciate her, to treat her the way she deserves to be treated, like royalty. She's the Queen of Steam, the spirit of Roanoke. She is 611, the last of the Jays, and it is all too likely that she will remain a fan favorite for many years to come. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Brian, Jack Carson's Row of Videos, Hayden DeGro, Master of None, Lord Hoff 444, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DM Trouble Typhoon, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hunter 2860, Icefer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Mr. Sleepy Matt Weaver, Adelbert Jaspers, Tom Redlion, NS Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, Dr. Race 78, The Baxter, Caleb Crosswhite, Ohio Trucker 1, and Joshua Long. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.